Hey guys, how's it going? It's X666X Iron Maiden, and we are back with some more uh, of the history of Poland. This is called the Animated History of Poland. Alright guys, so we're going to continue on learning more about Poland. Uh, ever since our first video of uh, the Unconquered, it's it's piqued interest. I, I, I do like learning my history. Um, I already know, obviously, I can cover my own country. The United States, obviously, we learn about the United States here in Canada, but we don't go much into Europe other than, you know, Britain, maybe France a bit. So I run into France a little bit because I am Acadian, so it's part of my heritage going further back. Where, where the Acadians originally came from uh, before we became Acadians over here. So I know a bit about that, but we don't go into too much else. We just learn major parts of things. So it's cool to learn in more detail about other countries. I've been enjoying it. Uh, you know, and plus you guys seem to be enjoying it, especially you guys from Poland. Shout out to you guys for really enjoying uh, someone checking you guys out. I don't, I'm, I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. It's, uh, yeah, it's well, you, unfortunately in one of the countries for some reason you don't hear that much you don't get reactors to check out that much and uh, uh, I'm glad that I can be one of the first ones to really go into it a lot for you guys uh, from Canada so this one is part one of a part two series of the animated history of Poland so we'll be getting to the other one eventually I'll put a little space in between it to keep you guys in suspense a little bit because I love doing that uh, but we will get to the other one down the road here. So without further ado, here we go, the history of Poland. This video has been made possible by The Great Courses Plus. Use the link below or head to thegreatcoursesplus slash Sweeney for your free one month trial and to show your support for the channel. Stick around to find out more. If you live in Central or Eastern Europe, you probably grew up hearing the folktale of the three brothers, Lech, Czech and Rus, the three legendary patriarchs of the Slavic peoples. While out on a hunting trip, the brothers had a disagreement, as brothers do, on which prey to follow, leading them to split up. Czech, the eldest of the brothers, followed his prey to the Czech lands. Rus, the youngest, went east and became the founder of Russia, and Lech, in the middle, founded Poland. Because who cares about consistency? The tale differs slightly from place to place, but many include that Lech travelled north as he followed a beautiful white eagle. The eagle landed in its nest at sunset and looked very breathtaking against the red sky. Lech took this for an omen and decided that the land would be his new home. The white eagle is still a symbol of Poland, blazoned against the red sky of their flag. Hmm. Cool. See, I already didn't even know that. I like the animation. Looks like it's going to be actually really well Indeed, done. Indeed, Poland did begin with Slavic settlements. The Slavs are likely a civilization that emerged as remnants of the early Indo-European peoples who had migrated out of the Caucasus. From their homeland in Central Europe, they began to expand and migrate in response to the weakening of the Roman Empire. You'll remember this from previous episodes as the Great Migration Period. The Poles loved their new home, which they shared with Germanic tribes from Scandinavia and the occasional Asian nomadic raiders. The Slavs of Poland were organized into smaller tribes living in and around the Baltic Sea and the Vistula River Delta. They united under Poland's first official leader, Mieszko. Mieszko was a Duke of the Polands. This was a good gig to have since the tribe eventually became the name of the whole country, Poland. Mieszko was a member of the noble house of Piast, whose dynasty would rule Poland for centuries. With his baptism in 966, the country slowly abandoned traditional Slavic paganism and adopted Western Christianity. Mieszko's son Bolesław the Brave expanded the territory south into what he hoped would be a strong regional power, but alas, it was a bit too early for that still. He established the Metropolitan See at Gniezno, forming the headquarters of what would become the Catholic Church in Poland. His consolidation of power led him to be crowned Poland's first official king, and then he died, all in the same year, which is great. The Pias dynasty was okay. somewhat up and down, and internal conflicts often plagued the royal court until this guy, Kazimierz the Restorer, restored the monarchy's control, which come to think of it is probably why they called him the Restorer. He modernized Poland into a feudalist society, which came with all those cool things like knights and lords and castles. This helped secure the borders, who up until now had changed depending on who was king. 
The early kingdom, somewhat weaker than its neighbours and strapped for cash, did however halt the Mongol invasion into Europe having been sacked twice before. Notable of this time was the Polish relationship with the Germans, whose dukes and lords had come to possess large amounts of the West, and the Teutonic Knights, who had carved out a significant state for themselves in Livonia and Prussia, a land inhabited by pagans, frequently raided by crusaders. By the time Piast rule ended with Kazimir the Great, Poland had lost much of its territory to its neighbours, but with a period of peace the state soon began to prosper and attract Jewish settlement. The counties in this area became a source of Anyone else pick up on that? The country began to prosper, and the, the Jewish people came. Now, if that is not a straight up, if no one picked up on that joke, I'm sorry. I'll just keep going. But contention between the kings of Poland and the Holy Roman Empire, who fought over the local lords for fealty and allegiance. This resulted in these counties being very mixed, with populations of people from messed up empire. Kingdoms. It says the MR. Was very unbohemian, really. The Jews first settled Poland as merchants on popular trade routes. By this century, the Jewish people had settled in great numbers over many kingdoms in Europe and began their long and very sad history. They were expelled by the masses in all the countries they settled and were often victims of massacres and worse, crusades. Successive expulsions led the population in Poland to swell, which was a comparatively more tolerant society, which became a centre of Judaic learning and culture as the centuries continued. However, things weren't always super peachy and anti-Jewish riots often erupted in Polish towns and synagogues were frequently burned. King Kazimir the Great, dying without an heir, left his kingdom to his nephew Louis, the King of Hungary. Louis left his now three kingdoms to his daughters, one of whom died unexpectedly, the other, who was supposed to inherit Poland but inherited Hungary instead, and the last one, Jadwiga, who got Poland. The nobles of Poland welcomed Louis's daughter and crowned her king. Yes, king, not queen, don't ask. Jadwiga's life would not be unlike a medieval television drama as she was simultaneously engaged to both the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Igela, whose kingdom was huge and powerful, and the Habsburg Duke of Austria who was inbred and fat. So, I'm just going to stop it. it. For those of you that have played the video game Civilization VI, is she the one that's the one that's in charge of uh, Poland and in the game? Is this the one uh, The one it is? I, I tried to pick up her name and I kind of missed it a bit there. But, uh, actually let me know. I think she made the right choice. The Union of Jadwiga and Vladislav formed the Polish-Lithuanian Union, which was now the largest country in Europe under a single monarchy. The Lithuanians had become a strong military power in the previous century, capturing large amounts of Russian and Mongol land. The now combined countries spread from the Baltic to the Black Sea. The Lithuanians, with their far smaller population, never ventured too far from their castles, why would you, and preferred to rule Ruthenia from Livonia instead. So by the time of the Union, the much larger Polish population came to dominate the Ruthenia lands spreading the language and the culture, eventually dwarfing their Livonian allies. The Teutonic Order, that German state on the Baltic, had become somewhat of a bad neighbour, leading raids, crusades and plundering castles or otherwise stumbling drunk into Polish-Lithuanian territory, starting fires and whatnot. The union of the two states proved beneficial, handing the knights a crushing defeat at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. They also fought numerous wars with the Muscovites, Tatars and Ottomans, Noteworthy of the Egalian period was the efficiency of the feudal system and the pseudo-democratic nature of the parliament, who set up sophisticated bureaucracy for king approval, or disapproval if you are unlucky. Within just a few decades, the Teutonic okay. Order had completely lost their state, with the western half being annexed directly into Poland and the rest becoming a faith of the Polish crown. This gave access of Poland to the prosperous Baltic seaports and an explosion in trade. Keep your eye on this, it becomes important later. The Prussian faith gotcha. would later be inherited by a duke from Brandenburg, a state within the Holy Roman Empire, a trend which would become ever more troublesome as lords within the HRE would increasingly inherit lands outside the imperial borders. The HRE was weird, don't worry about it. Acquiring Danzig or Gdańsk had huge economic benefits and cities swelled in size in response to the trade boom, like Poznan, Lwów and the capital Kraków and most notably Warsaw. Warsaw or Warszawa in Polish was up to this point just a small fishing village. Legend has it that a fisherman named Varsh happened upon a mermaid in the Vistula River named Shava. The two married and found the town of Varshava. 
The Poles, like most Europeans, were often embroiled in wars, and this made famous their heavy cavalry, the Winged Hussars, which I'm sure I'll be mobbed and lynched if I don't talk about. Initially Probably. a contingent of Hungarian mercenaries, Even I know about the Hussars, the Hussars became an elite shock cavalry so powerful they allowed the Poles to win many otherwise hopeless battles. The Hussars became the envy of Europe, the most powerful and disciplined heavy cavalry the Middle Ages had ever known, and are still a matter of intense national symbolism of Poland. The 16th century was a really big one, it included the Protestant Reformation, affecting mostly German parts of the kingdom, wars against the encroaching Ottomans invading Europe, advancing in science and literature with Copernicus, devising the heliocentric model of the solar system, the nationwide codification of the Polish language, and the biggest one, the changing of the Polish-Lithuanian Union into the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, a single political entity ratified by the Polish Parliament, or same, with elected rather than hereditary kings. Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, or just Poland for short, became a centre of power and commerce, and a bulwark against invading Turks would become a larger and larger problem for the European powers since their humble beginnings in Central Asia. During the Polish-Muscovite War, the Poles became involved in the Russian Succession Crisis, or the Time of Troubles, and began flexing their muscles with their famous Hussars. They even occupied Moscow for a short period, but were soon driven out because invading Russia is simply impossible unless you are the Mongols. The series of northern wars and the Russo-Polish War left the Commonwealth in a very precarious and weakened state. This was aggravated by the election of Polish kings, which opened the door for other nations to meddle in Polish affairs, which they did. A lot. During the wars, the Commonwealth lost the territory of Livonia and was devastated by the so-called Swedish Deluge, leaving much of the nation in ruins. Poland became weakened during the Great Northern War against Sweden, and during the War of the Polish Succession, it became increasingly clear that Poland's fate was going to be decided by its neighbours. The Polish Parliament became ineffective due to complicated veto laws which made passing reforms or mounting resistance to invasion nothing if not impossible. The political limbo and the sheer size of the Commonwealth started to make cutting pieces out of it look pretty attractive. The last king of Poland, Stanislav II, was elected in 1764 as a puppet of the Russian Empire, aided greatly by the fact that he was in bed with Catherine the Great. Stanislav did attempt reform to try and save face, but was aware the kingdom was on its last breath. Before long, the first partition of Poland was enacted, dividing the outlying provinces between Austria, Prussia and Russia. In dire straits, the parliament was powerless to stop the invading troops and forced to ratify the new borders. The Great Sejm tried once more to reform by drafting a formal constitution inspired by the liberties of the French Revolution, but it was enough to provoke Russia again who saw France as an enemy and Poland as a sympathiser to anti-monarchical sentiments. Pro and anti-constitutional forces became embroiled in a war and Russian forces invaded to broker a defeat to the Republican movement. With an agreement signed with Prussia, the two nations annexed more territory in the Second Partition reducing Poland to one-third its size and population. The king was horrifically unpopular. The army was in shambles. The parliament was divided and powerless. The common people were furious, and insurrections led to the National Rebellion, led by the military veteran Tadeusz Kościuszko. After an initial success, the rebels failed to garner support from many other nations, and were defeated by the surrounding powers. In 1795, the Austrians, Prussians, and Russians decided to put an end to the rebellious Poles and invaded them from three sides. The Third Partition of Poland, as it became known, wiped Poland off the face of the map for the next century. Millions of Poles now found themselves subject to whichever nation they were divided into, isolated from one another, and Poland ceased to exist. Now, as you all know, yeah, if you've ever up a map, Poland did indeed return as a sovereign nation, but we will have to get to all of that in part two. In the meantime, if you're interested in learning more, why not head over to the Great Courses Plus? Great Courses Plus is a subscription on demand wow, video sad. learning service dedicated to bringing you the best in lectures, from Ivy League university professors to National Geographic, on a wide range of topics. I personally recommend having a watch of The Great Crime of Empires, Poland Divided, which is part of the course on the history of Eastern Europe. This video was highly inspired by this series, and much of the research was done with their great lectures. Prices start as little as $14.99 a month, and Sweeney viewers are offered a free one-month trial, which they can access by heading to the Great Courses Plus slash Sweeney, or by clicking the link below. Do yourself a favour and check it out, it really opened my eyes to the great crime of the Polish partitions.
If you want to support the show directly, you can head over to my Patreon page or follow me with all the usual social media down below. Until next time. Well, I learned a lot on this one. All right. Well, that's it for that. It's, uh... That's a sad ending to that, though. That's, uh... Going to become such a strong, strong country. And then it just slowly turned around until the point where it just suddenly turned into nothing. It's, uh... Oof. It's, it's really sad to see. Um, it's a, quite a place to stop this part one, too, because it definitely makes you want to watch part two, which we will get to so we can finish this off and see Poland come back. I never knew that Poland was completely wiped off the map at one point for a whole century. Uh, we never learned that. We never. I, I did know about the Wing Hussars, mostly because of the Civilization game. There's one bone that that game does give some help to uh, the countries that it has put into the game because you do learn some stuff about those countries. And I do believe it was the king, uh, the king, the female king, that was used in uh, the Civ Six game. Um, uh, I could be wrong. I forget her name. I haven't played it in a long time, so I kind of forgot her name. And I think it was her here that was in there uh, that it showed when I had paused the video. So I have learned a little bit about her in the in the past because I did like playing uh, Poland in in the game. Uh, but I'm I'm excited to check out part two. It, it was a lot to a lot of learning, and I imagine part two we're slowly going to work our way. Well, we're obviously going to go through World War Two like we've been doing. It's it's going to be uh, probably a major part of part two, uh, and. I'd like to see how they came back from being wiped off the planet, the face of the planet, for a while. I, I, that's that's probably the thing I want the most now. After that's the huge cliffhanger, so I'll be looking forward to that uh, whenever we can finally get to part two. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure you hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe to see more from me. And as always, you guys have a good one. I'll catch you later. <laughs>